a lot of issues we did not touch on um, during this limited time. So we, you have to read the book, of course. It's a, it's a good read. It's a, a lot of information in there. Uh, to tell you in brief about a project called the Wheelchair Project for the Holy Land, the project of defiance where uh, Miko and many other uh, activists, Palestinians and Israelis, where they would go and demonstrate in uh, Palestine to really give the Palestinians their rights and so on and so forth. So we can really cover everything tonight, but um, uh, it's, a, it's a very good read. I recommend it very highly. Any questions from the audience? That went really, really fast. Yeah, we've been seeing the for a really long time. Okay, do we want to get to it on the microphone? Yeah. First of all, I want to just, watching this conversation unfold, it's so captivating. You have a, a, a strong presence, and thank you for sharing your story. Um, my question is, I can understand um, the Zionist perspective coming out of you, the, the Holocaust and that kind of survival mentality. What I don't understand, and maybe you can help, how, how is it that the United States has, has the same kind of perspective of the David and Goliath? Where does that come from? And, and how, how is it perpetuated here in the United States? Well, you know, I think the, I think the West bought into it for many, many reasons. I think uh, some reasons were kind of messianic notion of Jews returning and, and the Jews being this poor persecuted uh, minority and so on and so forth and uh, the need for Jews to return to their homeland so that there's a second coming so I think that's that's part of it maybe more than we realize the other part of it is that the Zionists you'd be amazed how effective the Zionist propaganda machine is it makes it seem as though all Jews in America are Zionists it makes it seem as though indeed all Jews around the world are Zionists when the Zionist idea came about, most Jews looked at it and treated it and looked at these guys like they were a bunch of lunatics. No Jew in his right mind would become a Zionist. No respectable family would allow their kids to become Zionists. They realized it was racist and it was crazy. Uh, but it was a, it's a very, very methodical PR system and it's a very, very methodical, well thought out, um, and very sophisticated and sly education system that operates in Israel and operates here as well, and it's very, very effective. I mean, look at this. The president gives this speech, acceptance speech, he talks about all these big issues, and he says, and we support Israel. Who cares if you support Israel? Why do you have to mention it? It's an issue. I can't completely explain it, but I think, but, 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 but I see how they do it, and it's very effective. And I think more and more American Jews are going to break away from their, from that, from that iron grip of the Zionists here in America. I think it's the biggest biggest mistake Jews made in America and around the world is that they is that they latched on to Zionism or they allowed by Zionism to latch on to them. And and they helped to perpetuate this. You know, APAC pretends like it's this really big, big dog. It's really not. It's a it's a very little dog. You know, but with a very big mouth and a very strong mark. Um, and so that's how it's perpetuated. It's just a very, very effective propaganda machine. Um, people who have questions, could you please come to this side so we can hand you the microphone? Oh, that's a good idea, yeah. Yes, Jordan. To follow up on that, you say APAC is a small dog with a big bark, but they have so much money. How can we combat that? Stop giving them money. I mean, I you know, we have, we have to have a countervailing force. Yeah, I agree. You know, you know, the, the thing is with APAC is this: it's a bully, and like any bully, it has to. Somebody's got to stand up one day and say, you know what? Take your money and go home. Now, it's not as, as simple as, as that because, of course, everybody wants to get elected and everybody wants to move on, and and they'd rather count out to APAC and to into Israel and move on with their other ambitions. Um, but I think it's. I think there's a process. You know, I'm going to be. I've got speaking engagements between now and Thanksgiving almost the entire time, and more than half of these events are organized by non-Zionist Jews, Jewish activists, and so there is a growing movement of Jews who's breaking away from that notion of APAC and the notion of Zionism, and I think gradually that will eat away at the power of APAC, and eventually, you know, they will shrivel down and die. But it's going to be. It's going to take some time. Thank you for your presentation. You are a very courageous man. Uh, I, mean, I have two questions. One, one first, 
is partially answered. How are you received by the American Jewish community when you uh, speak to them as you're speaking to us? And the second question, what, what is your prediction for uh, the situations of uh, the life of the Jews and Israelis in the Middle East 50 years or 100 years or 200 years from now? Thank you. You know, the way I'm received, you know, the, the mainstream Jewish uh, communities and organizations don't really like me. Um, the ones that do are very progressive, and like I said, I've got a lot of, there are a lot of them out there that are very supportive and, and, and organizing events uh, events for me to come and speak, so, so I'm pretty optimistic about about that. I think the only, you know, my, my, father's, my father thought that the best thing for Israel would be to make peace, to allow the Palestinians a Palestinian state in the West Bank, make peace with the other Arab countries, and just be part of the neighborhood and move on. The Zionists had another idea. The Zionists had a more kind of a more aggressive, brutal kind of a point of view. So his vision is dead. His vision did not materialize. There will not be a Jewish state living in peace in the Middle East because the Zionists destroyed that. The only option, other option, is for Jews to live in the Middle East the way Jews have always lived in the Middle East, and that's with, in peace with everybody else. They lived in, in peace, you know, Jews have been part of the Middle East for a, thousand, you know, a couple thousand years before Zionism came and, and kind of messed everything up. And I think, I hope that that, that is going to be the case. Now, today there are six million Israeli Jews living in, in, in Israel-Palestine. Um, I'm guessing they'll stay there, and there will be a democracy there for both, you know, a multinational democracy, which will hopefully survive, you know, the test of time. Uh, before we continue with the questions, I have a small announcement to make. Um, if you really enjoyed this event tonight the same way we enjoyed it, and if you like to support uh, the Levantine Cultural Center, you have some envelopes on your uh, tables, please feel free. Any donation or contribution and support is greatly appreciated. And most importantly, we'd like you, if you enjoyed this, to become members of the Levantine Cultural Center so we can have more interesting events like this. So on your way out, if you want to drop the envelopes or anything, or any information about yourself, please do so. You know, I want to say just one thing about that too. You know, one of the things that, that I've noticed over the last few years is a growing awareness in America to this issue. Away from the Zionist myth and, and, a, and kind of a better broader understanding. And one of the reasons for this is because there are events like this. A few years ago, the notion of having you know, a few universities, I think they were UCs mostly, began in, uh, what we call the Israeli Apartheid Week, or it's called Palestine Week, or whatever. Today, Last year, there were over 120 universities and colleges that held Apartheid Weeks. I spoke at several of them. And there are other speakers that go out and, and, and talk at these events. And more and more Americans are hearing that there's another story here. Now these are very politicized events, and there's a lot of tension because you know, the pro-Israel groups come and all this. This is a much better kind of environment when you talk about culture, when you talk about music, when you talk about the common, you know, the commonalities, which are really the thing that are going to, at the end, help us move forward. I, I, ever since I, you know, I met Jordan and I saw his vision, I, I think this is wonderful. So I really hope uh, everybody here would, would, would contribute to, to make this. Uh, this vision of reality, because that is exactly how people are going to realize that there's another side to the story, and it's not just another side to the story, this is a better side of the story. This is how we survive. We survive by realizing our common, our commonalities, and Israelis and Palestinians have much more in common than they have uh, that, that, that sets them apart. Please. Yes, thank you so much for speaking. This is my second time I see you because I'm so touched with your um, revelation. <laughs> I mean, everything you say, I already know about it because I'm from Lebanon, but coming out of an Israeli, uh, it's, it's really great to hear that. Now, my uh, concern about the one state or two state, two state, yes, it's almost impossible unless, you know, the government goes and, you know, takes those settlements out like they did in Gaza, which is, you know, a big, big project. But, so if that's almost impossible with the one state, now there is a big problem that the Palestinians, they're going to lose their identity. You know, it's a big issue. So how do you think that can be solved? 
And if it's one state, what is it going to be? Is it going to be Israel, Palestine, Palestine dash Israel? I don't know. I mean, like these are major issues. Yeah, you know, let, let me try to put it this way. From where I see it, from where I'm, the way I see it is, the one state, two state is really no longer a question. It is one state already. How do we know it's one state? Because everybody that lives there is governed by the, by the same government. Everybody, every Palestinian, every Israeli that lives between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean is governed by the state of Israel. Now, granted, the state of Israel has created a racist system where they govern different parts of the population with different laws. That's why people compare it to apartheid. So you've got the laws that govern Israeli Jews, like myself, completely democratic. I can say what I want, I can come and go when I want, I do what I want. You've got the laws that govern the citizens, the Palestinians who are citizens of Israel. And there are over 30 laws in the law books that discriminate against them. There's an entire culture of discrimination and racism that prevails and keeps them from getting good jobs and so on and so forth and moving out of their towns and environments. I mean, you know, a young Palestinian uh, couple, Israeli citizens, can't get a mortgage. Can't get a mortgage. It's not by law, but that's the culture. That's, that's the reality. That's the environment. You know, things like that. Um, you know, the most talented, brilliant, young Palestinian who finished university, whatever, is not, does not have equal playing field if he wants to get a job or she wants to get a job. It's a very, very racist and oppressive environment. And these are Israeli citizens. Not to mention already what happens when they try to leave Ben Gurion Airport. I don't know if you've had this experience, but when Israeli, now Palestinians, only Palestinians who are not from the West Bank are allowed to fly out of Ben Gurion Airport, right, in and out. The horrendous, racist humiliation that the security system in Ben Gurion Airport allows itself against, you know, to, 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 to exercise against Palestinians is, the, is absolutely unbelievable. Holding just, you know, anybody here, any one of you, four, five, six hours, opening, the, opening their suitcase again and again, body searches, strip searches. I mean, I hear stories all the time. I've got a lot of friends who are Palestinians and many of them are Israeli citizens. They all go to visit from time. Some of them live here, they're Americans. On the way out, what the Israeli society allows these people to do, and pays them well, by the way, these security agents that work at the airport, they get paid very well, is absolutely unbelievable. And should be stopped and should be protested against and so on. But this is part of it. And then you've got the Palestinians who live in the West Bank and Gaza, and there are no laws that protect them. There are no laws. It's the Israeli military law. It's even more brutal and more racist and more violent than the laws that govern Palestinians inside Israel. But it's all the same state. It's all the same government. Criminal cases are not tried in the West Bank. You know, if a Palestinian robs a bank or something, okay? They're tried in Israel. They sit in Israeli prisons, they go to Israeli, Israeli court, the Israeli court system that tries them. It is one state. It is already one state. It, is, it works like one state but it works like a racist state, and that's what has to change. Now, how do you compensate? What do you call the state? You know, smart people, Israelis and Palestinians, are gonna to have to sit together and figure out how they're going to create this new the future. What happens when apartheid falls? What happens when, when fascist dictatorships in South America and in Spain and in Greece fell? You know, how do people in Switzerland get along? Multinational st state. How do people in Belgium get along? A multinational state. You know, there are lots of examples of multinational states where people get along just fine. It's never perfect. There are always more and more problems. There are more, always more and more issues. But the, the basic step has to be, the very first step has to be ending the Zionist racist regime just like we ended apartheid in South Africa, just like we ended the legalized racism here in this country against, against blacks. And move on into a, into a completely different paradigm where this one state remains one state, but it's a democracy. And that's a transition that I'm talking about. Another thing that worth, I think it's important to mention, when Jewish people hear this, mainstream Jewish people hear this, when Israelis hear this, they freak out. They say, oh yeah, genocide, another holocaust. What genocide? We're not talking about killing anybody. What genocide? 
Why do you think somebody has to die? Transition from a dictatorship to a democracy does not have to be bloody. It doesn't have to be bloody. There are plenty of examples around the world where this happened and it wasn't bloody. That is the example that was said, and that is the example that has to be uh, used in Israel and Palestine. That is it. Why do we talk? What genocide? Who wants to kill anybody? Nobody wants to kill anybody. You know. But this is their first gut reaction. Oh, you're talking about genocide. You're like Ahmadinejad, whatever. Nobody's talking about destroying people. We're talking about destroying a system, bringing it down to its knees and creating something better instead. That's so fun. So that's a long answer. I'm, I'm Jewish, and uh, I heard about your book and read your book from my nephew who lives in Atlanta, Georgia, and who incidentally will be hosting with the group that you're coming to Atlanta in the next couple of months. And my nephew has been to the, the West Bank on four different occasions now. He spends two or three weeks each year with a group of pacifists who come to the West Bank from all over the world to build a home for Palestinians. And the one thing that he's impressed me is how much he's learned about the Palestinian people that he has met, worked with over the years, and what a warm, gracious, intelligent group of people they are. He communicates with them, he Skypes with them, and the one thing he's tried to impress on, on me, that you can, there's no way for anyone to really understand about what's going on in the West Bank to the Palestinians unless you go there and you experience it. There's just no other way you can talk, you can write, but when you see what they're doing to the Palestinian people, <coughs> taking their land, using their water supply, blocking off their routes from getting to A and B, that it is beyond atrocious. And I just want to convey that to all of you people. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. that, that. I just wanted to ask, I mean, if you need a microphone for this, have you tried to speak to APAC so there isn't that uh, <laughs> money going to Israel? Have you? I mean, no, you, APAC, APAC. You're, you're speaking to people who are interested and appreciative of you, but we yeah. want somebody who needs to understand that more yeah. than, you know, us appreciative. Well, I'll speak to them if they invite me, but I'm not on their on their list. <laughs> but I'll say this. But I will say this: the, the issue with APAC and the issue with Zionist, many of the Zionist organizations in America, it's not that they don't know. It's not that they don't understand. It's that they condone it. They think the racism is good. It's like the whites in South Africa or the whites in, in the South here in the United States. They don't think it's bad to kill Palestinian children. They think it's okay. That's the problem. That's why you can't sit after after the massacre in Gaza. You know, when, when you know exactly almost four years ago, when, when just before Obama was, was sworn in, I was I tried to, to go into Gaza and I couldn't because Gaza was closed off, and even more so because they were the attack was was pending. This was the beginning of December, and as you all know, December twenty seventh, eleven thirty in the morning, eleven twenty five in the morning, Israel began began carpet bombing Gaza. You know, hundred tons of bombs on the first day. You know, one ton bomb destroys, destroys a city block. Okay, a hundred tons of bombs in the, on the first of the tw first day of the 21-day attack. You can imagine, of course, as you know, Gaza is one of the most heavily populated, densely populated places in the world. So I came back here and I was invited to give a talk at the University of San Diego, and I talked about this massacre, and I called it a massacre, and I said it was one of the, probably the most shameful day in the history of the Jewish people. That moment that that attack began, I said it was the darkest day in the history of the Jewish people. So the, very, the first two rows were occupied by APAC and their supporters. And they came up to me and they were angry at me that I could criticize Israel on a day like this when Israel was being attacked. And what I said to them, it's very simple. 
This is not politics. It really isn't politics. It's a question of values. Do you agree that it's wrong to drop bombs on children or not? That's it. If you agree that it's wrong, then we have something to talk about. If you think it's okay to drop bombs on children, then we have nothing to talk about anymore. This is APAC. The reason there's nothing to talk about with APAC is because they think it's okay to drop bombs on children as long as they're Palestinian. Or Lebanese. As long as they're Arabs, it's okay to drop bombs on them. So the issue, issue with APAC and, and the Zionist establishment is not to convince them, it's to kick them out. It's to kick them out. It's to shame them, to, under, to shame them publicly that they can support that sort of thing. The fact that they can support the state of Israel, the fact that they support the Israeli army, is a sh they need to be shamed because what they're supporting are crimes against children, are crimes against humanity. Against humanity. And the fact that they control the politics of the United States. That's because the United States lets them. The money keeps going. That's because the United so, States lets them. So how do you think this should be fixed? Well, I don't know. The United States makes a lot of money by, by, by you know, these bombs are made in America. These planes are made in America. I mean, this is a, this is kind of a laundering of money. So, so it's it's not a, it's not a simple it's not a simple proposition. This is a very tough uphill battle that I think we should all engage in. But I think it's winnable. I think it's doable. You know, and what the gentleman here was saying about the Jewish activists about it's true. You, if if and, and I'm sure many of you feel the same way and know and know many of the things that I know. If you try to explain the day in the life of a Palestinian to an American, they think you're out of your mind. They think you're making it up. It's impossible to believe. It is absolutely impossible to believe the torture, the night raids, the shooting of innocent civilians, the the, the soldiers that get away with killing people. In, in broad daylight in front of everybody. This is absolutely impossible to believe. You know, you have to go there and see it for yourself. And of course, many people do go there and do see it for themselves, and that's a good thing. But I think, you know, I, I, you know, again, going back to the Levantine Center and to supporting it, you know, this is exactly the kind of an environment where people can realize that it's wrong to support APAC, that it's wrong to listen to APAC, that it's wrong to support Israel, because there are all these wonderful things happening in the Middle East, that there's a Palestinian culture. I remember my father, my father taught Arabic literature later on in Tel Aviv University, and he, and he, and he, and he added Mahmoud Darwish to the curriculum. It was the first time Israelis knew that there was such a thing as Palestinian poetry. This is the 1970s. You know, and then there was a big debate whether or not it's okay to allow Mahmoud Darwish to be taught at university. You know, there needs to be a place where normal people, just Americans, can come and learn and hear about these things, and I think, I think this is exactly the kind of environment that will allow for that to happen. And that's how you make APAC smaller and weaker. And that's how you make the state of Israel smaller and weak, weaker. And you show the culture, and you show the kindness, and you show the, the, what Palestinians are all about. And then, on the other end, you show the Israeli army. Now you've got, now, now you've got, the, now you've got some debate. So please, you, don't you think that when Israel asks I'm glad you brought that up. I'm glad you brought that up. I almost forgot. My sister Nuri just published a book. It's called Palestinians and Israeli Textbooks, and Israeli School Books. She did a report. She studied the Israeli textbooks, geography books, history books, and civic books. And she describes the racism, the textbook racism with which these books are written. There is no equivalent to that in the Arab world. Certainly not in Palestinian textbooks. And one of the, she, the book just came out, both of our books came out, her book came out a month later, but because it's an academic book, they only published a couple of copies and didn't think anybody was going to buy it. Of course, everybody wants a copy now. And she and I are going to be speaking in New York together next month. It is, it is absolutely unbelievable. The racism, the sophistication of the racism, how every page is planned, how the maps are laid out to demonstrate that Palestinians are either a threat, a problem, or don't exist. Those are the three categories that Israelis <laughs> learn about Palestinians. They're a threat because they're terrorists, they're a problem because they're poor and they're backward, uh, or they don't exist. You look at a map and there's no sign. You look at the map of the entire country, from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean, 
there are no Palestinian cities, there is no po po data about Palestinian population. They're called non-Jewish entities, you know, kind of vague. It's amazing, and there is no such equivalent, there is no equivalent on the Palestinian side. Because it's called Palestin uh, uh, Palestinians in Israeli, uh, in Israeli school books. If you Google her name or you Google that, it will come up. Yeah, it's, it's available. I'm sorry, yes, you have a question. I mean, I admire you being here. And I think about that more than anything. Uh, well, thank you. You know, people t t t say say very kind things to me about you know being courageous, and and, 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 I, and I and I do appreciate it, and I and I and I and, and I'm humbled by the compliments. I have to say though this: um, when I go to Palestine, I always go. To, you all know about the weekly protests in places like Bali, Nabi Saleh, and so on. Or if you don't know, you should know. The weekly protests every Saturday, every Friday after prayers. Um, now I often get arrested. So I get arrested, uh, you know, the army, they rough you up a little bit, they push you around, they take you, they interrogate you, at the end of the day you go home. Usually they handcuff or put shackles on, but not always. There's nothing heroic about that, let me tell you. Because I am a privileged customer. I'm a privileged customer. I think all, all Israelis should do this. I think every single Israeli should be there every Friday, every Saturday, marching with their Palestinian friends, with their Palestinian brothers. The heroes are the Palestinians that every single week get shot, get arrested, get tortured, get beat up by this terrorist organization called the Israeli army. Come back the next week and do it again and come back the next week and do it again, and then there's another village, and then another town, and another village, and another town, and they are relentless, and they are the heroes. They are courageous people. They are the ones that should be applauded and supported, <coughs> because they are really doing the work, and they are the really ones. When they get arrested, they don't go home at the end of the day. If they get to go home before a year is over, that's good. After they've been tortured and, you know, deprived of any rights that you, we could even imagine. So um, I think it's important to remember that, and I think it's important to tell people about this. You know, these, the, every single week, do you know how much tear gas they use? You know what it's like when these little, they call them rubber bullets. They're not rubber bullets, they're rubber coated, coated uh, metal bullets. When these things come flying at you, because they don't shoot them one at a time, they shoot them out of canisters, and you see these things coming at you. It's unbelievable. And then the night raids, and the children that get pulled out of their beds and beat up by the soldiers. Um, and they're unstoppable. And I know many. I know. All the, I know the leaders of these of these uh, of these protests. And they will never, ever stop. The Zionists don't know what they're up against. These are some very seriously courageous people, and they are the ones who are going to, you know, win this battle, win this struggle. So I just want to make that point. Thank you all for uh, coming tonight and I hope you enjoyed it and